A Gray Story of the Horror of Death, The Suicide, by Malcolm Ford Henry, from Weird Tales, December, 1926. I am a stranger amongst men, for I stand in the midst of friends, and they know me not. I speak to them, and they stare at me askance, and some of them look startled and grow pale, as they peer more closely into my face with an awed intake of breath. They are so amused, these mortals, that I fain would laugh, though I dare not, for what would be their feelings if they could fathom my true identity? But they never will, they never can, and I walk among them safe, for I am a stranger, and my secret will never be known to the end of time. In my mind's eye I can see them now, and I conceal a smile as I think how they would draw away from me with an awful horror in their staring eyes, how the blood would run cold in their veins, and their bodies would be racked with trembling in the terrible fear of the unknown, if they but knew. For I am dead, and... I am alive. My earthly being is a grim paradox manipulated by the mischievous fingers of some strange fate. I go forth on the walks of men, and my body lives, but I am dead. I am dead. I know that my spirit cannot again be burdened with the weight of a human body, condemned to the horrible fate of a terrestrial existence. Then why am I here? Let me look back. Let my retrospective gaze dwell upon the past, and perhaps I can fathom the depth of my sin and know why I must live, though I am dead. It began a long time ago, oh, many years ago, and I was but a child and played like other children. But was it like other children? I seem to hear a soft voice saying, My son, why must you be so rude to your friends? And so, as time passed on, I played or remained more to myself. One there was who sought to befriend me, one who, as I think now, was as near an angel in human form as can ever appear on this earth. I repulsed her with the rest. That which adds most to my present anguish is the clarity with which these images of former times burn in my mind. I repulsed her with the rest. My self-centeredness, my colossal selfishness, my impetuousness, my imperiousness. Do I wonder that friends were lacking? I cared for naught and my deformed soul spread in its path blackness and hatred. I had a mother whose love bounded upon fatuity. Now I have no one, nothing. I am alone. I am lost. They loved me, and I repulsed them. I lost all my old associates and sought new. I sank lower and lower yet they clung with strength born of desperation. They pleaded and fought to save me, ah, in vain. I was ruthless, and I crushed in their hearts their boundless faith in me. And then I sought the grim relief, the balm of crushed hopes, restful oblivion, suicide. How sweet a thing the death of the despairing dream. Nothing but the grave, cool, dark, restful. So I turn to suicide, but that dream is deceptive, terribly deceptive. It was so amusing, so highly entertaining. 
I can remember it all so distinctly. It seemed I was discouraged and heartsick, but I now wonder if I could really have conceived the agony of the broken hearts that I caused to ache. It was night, night when the darkness and shadows of the earth blended with the darkness of my soul, save that mine showed forth the blacker by contrast. Ah, night is so very close to death sometimes, and I, with all the despair of the wrecked and broken existence, gave myself up to that sweet dream which has been the elusive lure to myriad hordes that have passed before me. How dark it was! How dark is everything! I climbed, climbed high to the wretched attic of the house where I lived, for with the last faint glimmer of respect I had removed from the dwelling of my people to live apart in a wretched and destitute portion of the city, far away from the haunts of former days. How dark indeed was the attic, so that I needs must grope my way to the little window. There, without, was a huge iron hook, black and sinister, for what purpose I know not, but above the dark and silent street. To this I caught my rope. They found me at dawn, and I can see them now, for I did see them, their wide, distended eyes, awed, terrified, and I can hear their cries at first and later only the hushed, peculiar whispers that always betokened the presence of death. And then they came and cut me down, and drew me in with such care, with such dissimulation, as if they feared I might return to life and demand abruptly that I be left to my own devices. And they gathered around me still conversing in the same awed whispers, for they thought I was dead. And then some very important gentleman was bending over me and inspecting me, and later, when all was quiet, someone was weeping over me, not passionately or wildly, just a gentle weeping, like the wind whistling among the leaves. All the while I stood to one side, and watched the proceedings with consummate interest. I stood among the eager, curious crowd, and later I stood alone in the chamber when my mother came. It was not I, only that lifeless clay that had havened mine, and I, the real I, was unnoticed. But still I heard nothing, and indeed saw very little, and all the dark, the passionate, the corporeal despair seemed to have fled my mind and left over a more hopeless and consuming sorrow. I walked forth and attempted to find rest, but in vain. I visited my old haunts, but no one noticed or appeared even to realize my presence, and when I spoke to those with whom I had sunk so low, they only stared at me as if I were an intruder and there was one with whom I had consorted most, a dirty, evil wretch, in whom I had always found something of a kindred spirit. I spoke, and he growled a surly reply, but at length, drawn by some strange attraction, he took notice of me, and we entered into conversation. You knew him? I asked. He understood, and spat forth a vile curse. Ah, for many years, he growled with a sullen reluctance. And a low and more depraved dog never found the road to hell. God, that I should have associated with him, that I should ever have known him. I'm bad, sir, about as low and filthy as you can find. But not like him, thank God, not like him. I never had a chance. He had a mother and I saw her up there today. He had a mother, a friend, someone 
anyone. I never had. He but cheated the hangman. I would have killed him sooner or later. I fled precipitously, my whole soul burning as if in truth consumed by the fires of hell. This was one of the lowest and most depraved villains that had ever trod the dark and murky paths of the underworld. I suffered tortures, wandering on and on, knowing not where to betake myself, merely seeking, never finding. I sensed nothing but loss, felt no passion but grief, no sensation but sorrow, and the oppressive, desolate emptiness of the world. At length I aroused myself and took note of my surroundings, and was not a little surprised and agitated to find that I had wandered into the near vicinity of my childhood home. I attempted to restrain myself, but strode on as if fascinated, my eyes gazing eagerly upon the familiar surroundings. Familiar, I say, and yet possessed of a strangeness that I was unable to fathom. How peaceful and quiet the old street appeared in the gentle rays of the late afternoon sun that had burst forth from its concealment behind the day's murky gloom. How peaceful and quiet indeed, contrasting so harshly with the grating turmoil of my soul. There was the old house, its very familiar line. I halted, horrified, frozen. Upon the familiar old door hung a wreath. For a long time I stood motionless, while thoughts raced madly through my mind, while I stared at the dismal symbol of death, of the thing that lay beyond those doors. My vision seemed to pierce those stolid, unimpassioned walls, and see the thing that lay beyond, that stiff and clammy piece of clay that was I, and I was afraid. Trembling, as if taken with the ague, I retraced my footsteps to the little grocery store on the corner, and entered hastily, as if to escape something intangible that my mind failed to grasp. Everything was as I remembered it. Behind the counter stood the bent and sunken figure of the merchant that I had known all my life but older, much older than when I had last seen him. For a moment I thought he knew me, that unlike others he sensed what his bleary old eyes could not discern. A death, I said in a voice that was hoarse and unreal, I see there has been a death. A death, he repeated vaguely. Yes, there has been a death. Our loss, hell's gain. God, he was bad. For his own sake, it was well. But his mother, sir, she is a good woman. She didn't deserve this. Her boy, her own boy, if it could only have been otherwise. You knew him then? Knew him? Yes. The most despicable scoundrel that ever lived. It was his willfulness and hot-headed intolerance. He had every opportunity. If he had only died at birth, God knows the world would have been better. The sun had sunk below the horizon, and the cold, damp wind blew from the north. It seemed that things had changed suddenly to match the dismal foreboding of my mind. Fitful glares of lightning lit up the western sky, and lo! almost inaudible moans of thunder reached my super-acute senses. I hesitated before the house, and the black wreath seemed to oppress, to burden me. Then it receded as the door opened softly, and she stood before me. For a moment of utter silence we faced each other, silence broken only by the angry, far-away murmur of thunder. Then. Very slowly and softly, I stepped within and closed the door. But she continued to gaze at me and spoke in a low, apathetic voice. 
There has been a death. Who? Who are you? I am an old friend of his, I lied. No one had ever been his more bitter enemy. His mother, she is? Yes, there. She followed me into the large, poorly lighted library. The mother gazed at me from dry eyes that seemed vaguely to misunderstand, and I had a feeling of an animal that had been beaten, not knowing why. The younger woman was making some explanation that reached my ears but made no impression. Then the mother came forward to grasp my hand, and I found myself making answers to her queries. Yes, I knew him well many years. But he was not really bad. Oh, tell me that he was not. I glanced beyond her at the girl and saw in her eyes an expression of pleading. There have been many exaggerations, I replied evasively. Oh, he couldn't have been as bad as they say. He couldn't. For a moment, I thought she was about to break down. Presently, however, she composed herself and inquired in a stronger voice, Perhaps you would like to see the body. God, no, I exclaimed. And then, in a gentler voice, No, I would prefer not. Ah, he does not look as bad as that, she protested, cut by my thoughtless exclamation. He does not look so bad, they have altered his appearance. He is younger, more as he was in the old days. In the old days, when he was my little boy. It seems such a long time, so many years, but I have been very patient, very brave. It has been a long time, sir, a very long time, since he was a little boy, my baby with his baby laugh and bright eyes, just like other women's babies, and I loved him, too, just as they love their children, and I watched him and prayed for him, watched him grow. Oh, how could I know? How could I? God, help me, I wanted to be calm, to take it bravely, but he's still mine, still my little baby. She broke into a passionate weeping that told of a restraint broken for the first time. I was stunned, overwhelmed. Even despite the morning episode, I had expected something else. Denunciation, calm regret, anything but this. I turned wildly to the hall, but she was before me, and as I gazed into her face, at once quiet and pathetically pleading, I felt a recurrence of the old passion that the years had hardened, obliterated. I'm sorry, she said, with the old gentleness. I am sorry that you should have been here. It is the first time she has broken, but, oh, why had it happened? She had loved him, loved him better than life itself. And I, oh, the months, the years we fought to save him, and every night, every night I prayed for him. But it is useless. Oh, God! It is useless. Useless. I useless. How utterly vain she could not even dream. Out into the Stygian darkness and fury of the tempest I staggered. On and on. Seeking nothing now. Finding nothing. It is so dark. So terribly dark. And I am alone. Alone with my sorrow. Within me dwells the only lasting, the eternal hell. I am lonely, so lonely, and lost. The End of The Suicide by Malcolm Ford Henry 